Okay, uh, good morning everyone. It is so lovely to welcome you here. Uh, my name is Graham, I'm the pastor here at the church and it's been lovely to welcome people this morning. A particular welcome if this is your first Sunday with us or maybe you're visiting Edinburgh for the weekend. Uh, know that we love welcoming people here and it is always our desire that you would just be blessed by your time with us as a local church. So if there's anything that we can do to help you during your time here, please do make yourself known to us. We'd love to be able to do that. Uh, And it's just lovely to gather together as a church family on a Sunday morning. And we do this every week. And the goal is the same every week. It's that we would just encounter and savour the living God. And this morning is really special. Uh, We'll hear a bit more about that later in the service What you can expect in this service, we will spend a little bit of time singing together. Singing is just such a wonderful way of reminding us who our God is and what he's done for us. There'll be a section for the children. We'll spend some time in prayer. Um, Then hear about uh, a few things going on this week of Easter. Uh, And then we'll turn to God's word, the Bible, and we'll hear his voice. And Jonathan's going to bring us uh, the next installment in our series in John's Gospel. And... This Sunday is really special because today we're going to be thinking particularly about who our God is and what he's done for us in Jesus and the earth shattering implications of that. So maybe you're here today and it's been one of those weeks. Maybe you come here this morning heavy hearted, carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, all sorts of questions in your minds and in your heart. And so the invitation this morning is just to still ourselves and to come and to savour who Jesus is today. It's the most important thing that we can do this morning is to get ourselves to him. For we truly believe that there's no one like him. So there's going to be some words on the screen uh, from Psalm 22. I'd love us just to read these together. Psalm 22, this wonderful psalm that we're going to be thinking about later on in the service as it connects with the, the reading Uh, from John, and it just celebrates about what God has done. So let's read these words together. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. So why don't we stand and the band are going to lead us in a time of of song worship together. She's going to help us focus on who our God is. Why don't we stand? Christ became 
Just as before we take a seat, let's be greatly stirred by these words, which just capture everything we've been thinking about today, singing about God's love for us, Jesus on the cross. Paul would write this, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And so this is the God who we come to worship today, the God who has done everything for us in Christ. So why don't we have a seat and let's just as we maybe stay in this moment, why don't we just join our hearts together, let's seek this God in prayer. Now, Father God, we thank you so much for this morning and the freedom that we enjoy to meet together as your people, to sing your praises and to seek your face. Truly, there is none who compares to you. And we thank you for the good news of the gospel, this message that has been proclaimed down the generations throughout the earth that Jesus became sin for us, the power of the cross, the forgiveness and the newness of life that is found in the crucified and in the risen Jesus. We thank you that he is the great lover of our souls. And so just reflecting on the access that we have to you, the love that we have from you to call you Father, we just bring to you in the silence now the cries of our own hearts, the worries that are on our minds, the things that we bring in here today that perhaps have happened this week or are on the horizon this week. For those people that are on our hearts, for the failings that we have uh, done this week and also for those answered prayers, those thanksgivings for your faithfulness. Lord, in the silence now, we just bring all of these petitions of our hearts to you. And so it's just our prayer today that by your spirit dwelling amongst us, that we would be greatly strengthened by the grace that's in Jesus. Father, may we leave here with a bigger picture of your love for us demonstrated in his death on the cross. Father, we turn to pray for our world today. We we thank you, Lord, that the earth is yours. Father, we look around at what's going on just now. Lord, we just bring to you the situations in Haiti, Lord, we pray for a restoring of order to that society. We pray for a protection on the vulnerable. We pray for the work of aid agencies. We pray for the witness of your people. Lord, we ask that you would be at work in that uh, most dreadful hour of that that, uh, country. Lord, would you be at work there, we pray, bringing peace, bringing justice. Father, we remember the events in Moscow this week. We pray for those who are mourning loved ones. Lord, we pray that you would draw near to them. Again, Father, that that city would be marked by peace. And Lord, that's our prayer as well for the situation continuing in the Middle East. We do pray again for peace in that region. We pray for wisdom for those at both a local and a world level who are in places of power. We pray that you would grant them the insight Lord, that you would just remove revenge and war from their hearts. Lord, we pray that care would get to those who need it. We pray, Father, that healing would be available for those who need it as well. And Lord, ultimately, we pray that justice would be done. Lord, we pray for our nation today. We pray for Scotland. We we love our country. Father, we long that Jesus would be made great up and down this land. Father, we pray for churches all over this country who are meeting today, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them and speak to them. Father, we pray for our government. We pray for our Christian politicians. We pray for local councillors. We pray for those in authority at every level, that you would grant them wisdom and insight to rule well, that they would rule and make decisions for the goods of our people. Father, we pray this morning for Ferry Well, the project that we are involved with as a church and support in the north part of the city. 
uh, people there experiencing so many different things. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them. We pray for John and the team, Lord, that you would grant them strength. We pray for the relationships with the local schools and the young people that come along. And that, Lord, that you would continue to be at work in that part of our city. Father, we remember our brothers and sisters at Peebles Evangelical today again. We're praying for them this month. We pray that they would be experiencing your favor. We thank you for the partnership that we have with them. And we pray for them as they continue to witness in that part of the borders, Lord, that you would be near to them and bless them. Father, we pray for our church family finally. We thank you for each other today. Lord, we want to rejoice with those who are rejoicing today. We just rejoice with Graham and Rachel today, with the birth of Caleb. Lord, we thank you for just your faithfulness in that situation. Lord, we also want to weep with those who weep. And we bring to you, Lord, those on our minds uh, who are perhaps experiencing pain, the pain of bereavement, the pain of just physical ill health. And Lord, we pray that you would draw near to the brokenhearted today. Father, we pray for our Easter events that are coming up next weekend. We pray, Lord, that they would go well, that you would use them to draw people from our community in here, that they might hear about Jesus. And Father, we thank you just for this morning and the opportunity that we have to hear your voice as we turn to your word. Lord, may we leave this morning changed and transformed because we've caught a greater glimpse of Jesus' love for us. So Lord, be with us today. Be moving in, uh, in our midst. Be strengthening, be comforting, be challenging us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen. Peter. Okay, good morning, everybody. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, my name's Peter. Uh, I'm the youth pastor at the church here. So I get to work with the kids, and kids, I want to invite you along. And just while they're doing that, do we have a photo that we can show? Yeah. Okay, kids, can anyone tell who this is? Does anyone know who this is? Have a look. Just, oh, just while I get these things sorted. Okay, a few hands up. Caleb. This is Caleb. This is a photo of Caleb. Caleb who? Do we know? Caleb? Dodds. Caleb Dodds, that's right, who was born just a couple of days ago. So there's a photo of Caleb. So that's great news. We already prayed uh, for those guys, but that's fantastic news. There's another baby born uh, to join us. Okay, the other thing I need to say before, uh, before I talk to kids uh, is this Saturday is our open day. I mean, this applies to you kids as well. Okay, I hope you're coming. Uh, for our open day. Can anyone remember what's going to be at our open day? Can anyone remember what's going to be at our open day? Something exciting, particularly for you guys. It is rated for adults too. It is rated for adults too, so adults can go on it, but I think it's probably mostly for you kids. Do you remember what it is? What's going to be at the open day? Bouncy castle. A bouncy castle, exactly. There's going to be a bouncy castle upstairs. Uh, There's going to be some games and various things. There's going to be food downstairs. So there's going to be lots of things going on. So I hope you guys are going to be there. And that applies to everyone. Okay, this is for everyone to come. Uh, we want to uh, encourage our community, our neighbours, all to come in, join in with the open day. Okay, and if you're volunteering, uh, it'd be great just if we could meet just in this corner here, just after the service. So grab your tea, your coffee, whatever. Uh, bring it over to this uh, corner, and we'll just have a quick uh, chat about Saturday. Yeah. What do you want to say? Are they going to be crafts? That's right, there are going to be crafts. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Oh, that's terrible of me. I forgot to mention the crafts. That's right, Corey, sorry. Corey is in charge of crafts, so there's going to be crafts, Easter crafts as well. Well done for reminding me. Okay, right, on to the kids' talk then, quickly. Okay, so here, if you have a look, you will see that I've got some broken things. I've got some broken things. So I wonder if anyone would like to come up and have a look, maybe choose something. Right, up you come, Hugo. Choose something here of these broken things and have a think, how might you mend it? How might we be able to mend it? And I'm ask, not asking you to mend it right now, but I'm just having a look. Over here, we've got some various things that might work to mend it. So we've got some wood glue, we've got some super glue, we've got blue tag, 
sellotape, gaffer tape, string, we've got nails, screws, screwdriver, hammer. What have you got there? Okay, you've got a broken Nerf dart, okay? At our house, there are a lot of Nerf darts and a lot of broken Nerf darts. How do you think you might fix uh, a broken Nerf dart? What do you think? Have a look, what do you think? Is there anything here that would work or not? Maybe tape wouldn't work because it would weigh it down too much. Okay, so yeah. probably super glue. Okay, so the super glue might fix it. Yeah, that might be the thing to do. I think you're right. What do you guys think? Do you think super glue would probably be the best option? Yeah, thumbs up for super glue. Okay, okay, somebody else want to come up and have a look? Elio, yeah, you want to come up, have a look. What do you think? What have we got here? Okay, so we've got a big piece of broken wood. Two pieces, in fact, two pieces of broken wood. Uh, we've got a little toy chair that's broken. How do you think? How do you think you might fix that? I don't think that. I don't think that glue or cellophane could do it. No. What do you think could do it, Anya? Well, actually, I think it could go this way. So maybe if not a screw. No, they're probably too big. Hammer. Okay. What do you guys think? Good option or not? Some people are agreeing with you. Some people are not so sure. I'll have maybe give it a try. Well, maybe we have to give that one a try and we'll see. Okay, later on. Right, thank you. Anybody else want me? One more person want to come up? Tiago, come up. Have a look. What do you think? What have we got here? We've got... Uh, this is like a siren that goes on a bike that doesn't work anymore. Okay, we've got a remote control car with a wheel that's come off. How do you think you could fix that? How do you think you could fix that? Um, maybe a screwdriver. Okay, maybe you need to put a screw in to hold it on. Maybe? Maybe it works already. Maybe it'll work already? You're right, it just fits back together. That was a bit of a trick one. I just needed something else that would that could fix. Yeah, you can just put that one back together. So we've got various broken things. Now what? Okay, various broken things that, that needed fixed. Um, this one I would probably use some wood glue, stick that together, clamp it together, maybe some wood glue would, would, would fix that. Okay, but what if, what if you had a broken friendship? What if you had a broken friendship? How could you mend a broken friendship? None of these things would work with a broken friendship. Right, but the friendship I'm thinking of, it's not just any friendship. It's the friendship with God, okay? Our relationship with God, our friendship with God has been broken, okay? Does anyone know why that got broken or how that got broken? What is it that breaks our friendship with God? Why can't we just all be friends with God? What is it that breaks that? Sin. Sin, exactly, sin, okay? All the, all the bad things, all the things that we think or say or do that breaks God's law. Sin, it breaks our friendship with God. And last week, we heard about a special meal. Last week, we heard about a special meal, okay? Jesus had a meal with his disciples. This was a Passover meal. They were remembering Passover when the angel of death passed over the Israelites, okay, uh, and they were saved from death because of the blood of the lamb that was put over their doorways. So they were remembering the Passover, this Passover meal. And during this Passover meal, Jesus explained what needed to be done to fix the friendship with God. Okay, you can't use a hammer or glue to fix the friendship with God. It needed to be, okay, this is what Jesus, he used the meal. He took some bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Jesus said that his body needed to be broken so that our friendship could be mended with God. Okay, then he took the wine and he said, this wine, this is my body, or this is my blood, sorry. This is my blood poured out for you. Jesus said, Jesus was using the meal to explain to his disciples, this is what needed to be happened. Jesus' blood needed to be shed so that our friendship with God could be mended, could be fixed. Jesus was explaining to his disciples that he needed to die so that the problem of sin could be fixed and that our friendship with God could be fixed. And we'll be thinking more about this and more about what happened to Jesus uh, when we go to kids' church. And we'll be doing that just next 
I don't think it's a song next, um, but just during the next bit, during the next bit, we'll head out to our various groups. So the creche and roots, the youngest ones, will head out to room three with Naomi and Arlie. The field, out this way to room two, uh, uh, with another Naomi uh, and, and Neve. Then kids' church upstairs uh, with myself and Ian. Uh, and then the embassy, you're heading out to room one. So all the secondary school kids, embassy, room one with Archie and Kirsty. Okay, so let me just pray. Uh, and I'll hand uh, back to Graham, I think. And then we, and we'll head out. Okay, you ready? P R A Y. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the boys and girls here. We thank you again for the birth of Caleb. Lord, I pray with, you'd be with those guys. Lord, we thank you for all the boys and girls here. Thank you for the joy uh, that they bring. Thank you for the, the, the life and love that, uh, that they bring. Lord, thank you for the parents uh, who bring them along. Thank you for all the kids' church leaders uh, and all the various leaders of the, uh, of the groups. Pray that you'd be with them as they seek to take good care of the kids uh, for the next little bit and as they seek to teach them more uh, about you, Lord. Uh, and I pray your Holy Spirit would be at work, Lord, as we l- think more about Jesus and about what he did to fix our relationship, our friendship with you, Lord. And I thank you that you sent Jesus, Lord. And I thank you that he died for us so that we could be friends with you. So I pray you'd be with us and help us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, just before we do that, just a few verses. Are they coming up on the screen, Johnny? Yeah. A few verses from Revelation before we sing this song. It's called Salvation Song, and it takes us right through from... Our salvation being worked out before the dawn of time, right to Jesus in the in heaven. And then I looked and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. And now we're going to sing some of these words together. Let's stand together. Two, three, four. Thank you. 
Christ will shine forever, love's unfading splendor, earth and heaven will bow in all, joining in salvation's song. Okay, well... As many of you might know, this morning, today is Palm Sunday, uh, this day where the church down the ages have remembered Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, Palm Sunday is always marked the beginning of Passion Week or Holy Week, as you might know it by, just the, the final days of Jesus' life, where Christians down the ages have just prepared their hearts for the most significant of days Uh, as we remember and we think about Easter. And so to do that as a local church this week, we thought it'd be great just to have a week of prayer. Uh, There's the slide on the screen. Uh, As we seek to do that, just prepare our hearts for the most significant of days. Now, we want to do this on Zoom just to make it as accessible to as many people as possible and as simple as possible. So we're going to meet on Zoom at 8 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Saturday. Uh, and the Good Friday service and the Sunday service, there'll be more information about that at the, at the end of our time together. But we're going to meet from eight o'clock to roughly about half past eight, all of those nights. And what we're going to do is we're just going to have a couple of readings from the Bible, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. Uh, we're going to spend some time in prayer together. And we're going to watch a series of videos called The Last Days of Jesus, which piece together the things that went on in that final week of his life. These videos are just five minutes long, but they're just really helpful to help us understand some of the things that that, uh, went on in the last week of Jesus's life. Maybe just to give you a little bit of a taster of what that's like, here's the one that they produced for Palm Sunday. I think we can roll it here. As we think about Holy Week, which we're entering into now, A lot of times we think about Palm Sunday and we think about Easter Sunday and everything in between gets a little bit fuzzy and we lose track of some of the details of what happened in the biblical storyline. We decided to ask a number of New Testament scholars if they would help us out, provide some of the historical, cultural, theological background, the sort of things that we might miss as we're reading through the story. We want to take each day of the week and try to answer some of those questions. So let's start with Sunday, Palm Sunday, March 29th the first day of the week, first day of the Jewish week, and really the last week of Jesus' earthly life. We call it Palm Sunday because a crowd of Jesus' disciples, his followers, along with these Galilean pilgrims in town for the Passover festivities, had spread their palm branches and, and their cloaks on the ground as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now, most of us know at least that much of the story, but the the details, the setting, the background, how many people actually populated Jerusalem at that time? How big was it? How many people were in town visiting for the festival? And what were they expecting from the coming Messiah? And what made this situation in particular, Jesus' actions, so volatile for the Jewish and the Roman leaders? Jerusalem was a very exciting place about this time of the year. Uh, Passover is one of the great pilgrimage festivals for the Jewish people. And so a city that people estimate might have been around 40,000 would uh, sometimes get to be six times that size at that time of the year as Jews flocked in from everywhere. It was a very exciting place, a busy place, a crowded place, and a place that the Romans really worried about during that week. As all of these Jews were gathering together, they were excited about their religion, and the Romans wanted to keep control of that, and so they were extra watchful of the Jews during that time. The way Jesus entered the city, mounted on a, on a donkey, uh, fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah that, that the Messianic king would enter the city of Jerusalem 
exactly in this way. Uh, it was very significant. It also emulated the way Solomon, King Solomon, entered the city when he was declared king. So the, the message, uh, you know, visually uh, and spiritually was unmistakable that here the Messianic king came to enter God's holy city, Jerusalem. The crowds responded uh, with uh, excitement because they, many of them had heard about the Messiah and were expecting a national deliverer to reestablish the Davidic kingdom. And so Jesus is one who taught with authority, uh, far exceeding their other religious teachers, is one who healed, who even raised the dead, very much looked like the part of the Messiah. And so they welcomed him and then and, and prepared uh, the way for him uh, as the Davidic king entering the holy city of Jerusalem. Jesus was entering into a very volatile situation then. And we could well understand how his entry into the city and some of the things that happened that week would have created a lot of concern for both Jews and Romans. Romans who wanted to keep the lid on things, but the Jewish authorities who wanted to keep a good reputation with Rome as well. They didn't want to let things get out of hand either because they wanted to keep good relationships with Rome. And so it was a very pressurized situation for Jesus and his disciples uh, during that, that week of uh, what was called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, culminating in Passover. So let me encourage you to make the most of this opportunity this week that we have. One of those videos for, for every night next week. Uh, time to pray together, time to hear from God's word. Please do, uh, let me encourage you to get involved. The usual Zoom prayer link, it will go around in the, the newsletter as well. Uh, please do get involved. But we're going to turn to God's word now. Can someone get the door? Sorry. And we're going to be in John 19. So let me encourage you to grab a Bible and come with me to John chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to use the ones on the pews round about or scroll on your phone. Uh, it's really important that we have God's word open in front of us. And Pamela is going to come and just read to us our verses from this morning, beginning at verse 16. Pamela. My name is Pamela, and I'm a member here. The Bible reading this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 19, starting halfway through verse 16, through to verse 30. So, the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece. Let's not tear it. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, 
They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar, <clears throat> a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you very much, Pamela, uh, for reading to us. Uh, this is a great passage, and I'm, I'm excited this morning to be able to bring it to us. So thank you, Pamela, for reading. Let me just pray as we, as we begin. Go on, Father, just give us open ears to hear your word. Speak to each one of us this morning and soften our hearts through the Holy Spirit to hear what you have to say. Amen. So this morning, we're going to see a death like no other. We've read our passage. We know what's going to happen. And here this morning, we've read and we'll see that King Jesus, he is crucified Fulfilling messianic prophecy, taking that substitutionary place to redeem through his death. Now that is a big, complicated sentence. And as we go through, we will see exactly what that means. You know, this morning, we have our passage, and it is all about Jesus. There's lots of different people in it, and we'll go through it. But this passage is all about the Lord Jesus. You know, there's that phrase, isn't there? Famous last words. Normally it's in the sense of, you know, I'll clean the dishes before bed. And then my wife will say, famous last words, that'll never happen. You know, it's things like that, isn't it? But you know, it got me thinking. Here we have Jesus' famous last words, or really, word. Because in the, in the Greek it is one word. And his words are, it is finished. And so I looked some others up. Maybe you know some. Sometimes people talk about things like this. You know, Bob Marley, he died quite young, and his last words, supposedly, were, money can't buy life. That's what he said. Poignant, I would say. Winston Churchill, he was quite old when he died. He did a lot. I'm sure we all know who that is. He is supposed to have said, I'm bored with it all. And Bessie Smith, she was a soul singer in America, and she said, I'm going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. Some pretty interesting last words there. But I'm going to say that it is finished. There's no greater last words than that. Jesus has completed fully the plan of salvation. This plan that was hatched before time even began, before the world was in existence. This was the plan. Now, if you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus, maybe you've heard of him, but maybe you're here exploring who he really is and why he matters. Then hopefully by the end you will see why these words have such a big impact on your life and why you've got decisions to make. And if you do know Jesus as your saviour, then we will be reminded of the magnitude of Jesus' work of the cross. This completed work and why it should cause us to recoil in horror at what happened to him. And yet also rejoice in the freedom we now enjoy through life in his name. So we've started this passage, as, as Pam said, halfway through a verse. So we need to know where we've been, okay? I realize you might not have been here the last few weeks. So, where are we? 
Well, Jesus has completed his active ministry on earth. That ends in about John chapter 12. He then goes with the disciples into the upper room and he washes their feet and then he teaches them about how to live once he is gone. He spends a good few chapters of John teaching them about life after he's away. And as we just saw very helpfully, Palm Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem. And he is arrested by the Jewish leaders and he is handed to Pilate. And Archie and and Ian last week, they took us through exactly what happened in that. The Jewish leaders, they demand Jesus' death. They do not want him. They reject him. And yet Pilate finds no fault. Pilate says, I can find no fault with this man. He does not deserve to die. And yet he gives in. And the start of 16 says, finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Pilate, the people pleaser, he just hands him over to die. It's worth remembering as well, and and once again, that's very helpful, that here in our passage this morning, this is actually Friday. This is what we now call Good Friday. The disciples, they certainly would not have called this Good Friday. This was a terrible day for them, so they thought. But that's where we are, and it's the day of the preparation before the Passover, and we'll think about that a little bit later. So we're going to see this morning, this is all about Jesus. It's about Jesus the crucified in 16 to 18. Jesus the king in 19 to 22. Jesus the Messiah in 23 to 24. Jesus the substitute in 25 to 27. And Jesus the redeemer. You know, at first glance, it seems that this passage, you know, we're not entirely sure what to think. I don't know about yourself. Certainly when I first read this, when I started studying, I thought, what am I going to say about this? It's almost too familiar, isn't it? But you know, really, this passage, it almost seems at first glance to show Jesus' humanity. But really, as we delve deeper into it, we'll really see that Jesus is in fact God. And that is what John is trying to show us. John 20, verse 31, the whole reason that he writes, he says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. That is why John is writing. He is showing that this Jesus is all of these things. But that all of these things that he is truly God. So let's start with Jesus. The crucified. So verse 16. Pilate he gives in. He just wants to please the Jews. As was said in that video. There was real tensions. Pilate was in charge of this area. He was the Roman official but he needed to keep it under wraps and he was worried about what the Jews were doing. And we need to not gloss over the crucifixion because of familiarity. You know, Brunsfield's logo, it's got a cross in it, doesn't it? I don't know, anyone here might have a cross necklace on. People wear them, it might be a fashion thing or it might be to show their faith. But crosses are common symbols, aren't they? They're common symbols, we see them. And it quite rightly is the central image, the central symbol of the Christian faith. But you know, to first century people, wearing a cross around your neck would be just totally abhorrent. A symbol of death, of shame. A horrifying symbol to put anywhere. And that's what the cross was. Crucifixion, it was a method of corporal punishment that the Romans had designed or potentially they stole it from the Persians. Don't really know. But it was to be as drawn out, as painful, as shameful as possible. And it was kept for the worst of the worst, the non-Roman citizens, those who just, the, the Roman society just didn't care for. And they used it as a deterrent for others. The person, they were stripped naked They were beaten, as we saw last week. They were elevated in a place that everyone could see, lifted up on high. They had nails in their hands and their feet, and they died by suffocating slowly as they hung there. The crucifixion was a horrible method of death. And this is what happened to Jesus. Now you might be saying, yeah, well, there's two others there. They're crucified as well. What about them? 
I'm sure there was many others, countless others that were crucified in their time. That's true. That is right. And everyone dies, don't they? That is true for each and every one of us. But Jesus was different. Isaiah 53, 12 says this, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus was different. Yes, he died in the same way, but we'll go on to see why it was so different. Pilate could find no fault. But Pilate could find no fault in an earthly way. But Jesus had done nothing wrong at all. He was the sinless one, the one who had done no wrong. And that was only possible because he was truly God. John actually here, you've maybe noticed, he doesn't actually mention much about the cross. He doesn't mention the details, what actually happened physically. He's more interested in the why. Why does this happen? Well, the innocent one has been wrongly accused and put to death. And yet this was all part of the plan. That takes us to Jesus, the king, in 19 to 22. So we have Pilate's inscription here on the cross. This would have been a plaque, and it would have gone above the person. And we've seen that over the last few weeks, Ian took us through that Pilate questions Jesus. He says, are you a king? And Jesus says that his kingdom, this is Jesus speaking, he says, my kingdom is for the world, but it is not from the world. Pilate couldn't get it. It wasn't an earthly kingdom that Jesus was talking about. But we saw that Jesus, he was mocked for this. The Roman battalion, this was 600 soldiers. They dressed him in a robe. They bowed down mockingly in front of him. And they made a crown of thorns and a staff to mock him. Then we have that shocking statement from the chief priests, these Jewish leaders who say, we have no king but Caesar. Something that in their faith just goes against everything that they should believe. You know, this inscription, this was common. And what it actually was, was that at the top it said the person's name. So in this case, Jesus of Nazareth. And at the bottom was actually their accusation, why they are being killed. It was used as a deterrent, the crucifixion. It was used so that no one would ever do that crime again. You know, the two people either side of Jesus, they would have their name. And then they would have what they had done wrong. They would have murderer or they would have robber, whatever it was. So it makes sense, Jesus of Nazareth. But what doesn't make sense is the king of the Jews. Jesus is being killed for being the king of the Jews. The chief priests here, they're absolutely livid. They say, do not write the king of the Jews. That's not right. But that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. You know, they were so angry because everyone could see it and everyone could read it. He was left, Jesus was lifted up on a place that was raised up. It was near the entrance to the city, so people were walking in and out. As we've heard, it was a busy time of year. People would be coming and going. They wouldn't all fit in the city. They'd have to go in and come back out to stay in different places. And it was written in the three main languages of the world of that day, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Everyone could see it, and the Jews hated this. They hated that everyone could see it. So Jesus is being killed for being the king of the Jews. He doesn't look like a king, does he? Which king have you seen that looks like that? Where are the conquering armies? Where is the throne room? Where are the the royal subjects who do his bidding? What kind of king is this? You know, the true king, he conquers evil by letting evil conquer him. Now, that doesn't seem to make sense, but Jesus, he gains the victory through an act of self-giving love. Sometimes it's called the upside-down kingdom. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And at the end here, Pilate in 22, he's, he's kind of over the Jews. He's over trying to please them, and he just says, what I have written, I have written. He's dismissing them, saying, get out, basically. 
Pilate here, despite his ignorance in the previous section, he unknowingly just proclaims the truth that Jesus is the King of the King of the Jews. In chapter 18, Pilate says, What is truth to Jesus? And yet here, unknowingly, he writes the truth. King Jesus being killed. That takes us to Jesus, the Messiah. So this section with the soldiers, um, where they, they cast lots. You know, this at first glance, this can just seem a little bit of an odd detail to have in. We can read it and kind of just gloss over it and go, well, I'll go to the next bit. I'll go to the next bit. But what happens here is that the soldiers, they've put Jesus on the cross to die along with the two others, okay? Now, they did this at nine o'clock in the morning. Now, the crucifixion lasted all day. It could last all day. Here, in this case, it lasted about six hours. So it was a long day, and the soldiers, they would have to guard the cross, make sure that people didn't come to try and you know, stop what was going on. That was their jobs. So what they would do is, and this would have been commonplace, was that they would, they would just take the person's clothes who was being killed. They weren't going to need them, were they? So they would take them. But what they do is it is this undergarment, and it is woven in one piece, and they decide not to break it apart. It will ruin it. So they cast lots. So what these Roman soldiers actually do here is that they unwittingly fulfill a thousand-year-old prophecy. A prophecy from the time of David, a thousand years before Jesus, is here on the cross. And it's quoted there, and it might be in inverted commas in your passage, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now that is a quote from Psalm 22, verse 18. Graham read from that psalm at the beginning. And that there is a verse from a prophetic messianic psalm. And basically what that means is that it's a prophetic psalm, so it's looking to the future, looking to when the Messiah will come, and that that person will fulfill certain things. And that is what happens here. The video helpfully showed us that Jesus coming in to Jerusalem in that way was fulfilling the messianic prophecies. And likewise, this happens here. You might be thinking, so what? What's the relevance here? Well, it shows us that the Bible is the true inspired word of God. This fulfillment here shows that Jesus is, as John 1 says, the word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus is the Messiah. He's not just another man being killed. He is the Messiah, the promised king who would come to conquer. In verse 18, where Jesus is, is crucified with others, that is a fulfillment of that passage I read in 53 that shown that Jesus will be numbered with the transgressors. He will be killed with other people, basically. Something that is completely out with of Jesus' control. In a humanly sense, he couldn't make that happen. In verse 28, Jesus fulfills Psalm 69, we'll see later on, by being given vinegar for his thirst. Soldiers offer him this vinegar. You know, the Jews, they rejected Jesus as king, as their Messiah, because he wasn't the king that they either expected or that they wanted. One of the guys in the video said that, that they expected somebody to come in to conquer the Romans, to set up a Jewish nation again, to have an Israel, and they expected this king to come. He was not the hero they wanted. But he was the promised Messiah. So that takes us to Jesus, the substitute. We've seen Jesus crucified. We've seen Jesus the King, Jesus the Messiah, and now Jesus the substitute. You know, again, we have another little section here in 25 to 27 that we can read. And we can just sort of say, okay, and then move on to the next bit. But what happens here is amazing. Jesus, he sees some of the people that are watching. So that's what would happen. People would go. Maybe it would be people that they know or people would just watch uh, out of some sort of morbid interest. But here he sees some of his friends and his family. And what he does is he calls on John, the disciple, the person writing this account of Jesus' life. And he says, look after my mother. And likewise, he says to his mother, look after John. 
You know, Jesus' mother Mary, we, we reckon that most likely she was a widow by this point. So it would have been the cultural practice that she would have been looked after. And Jesus, knowing that he was about to go, says to John, please look after my mother. Take her in and look after her. Jesus is ensuring that his mother is looked after. Those that whom he loves are cared for once he is gone. And there's two sort of side things to note here before the main point, the side thing. One is that John the writer is actually watching the events unfold. Last couple of weeks, we've learned from Archie and Ian that they really enjoy true crime and true crime videos and podcasts, and they like watching these things. But what do the police look for when they're trying to solve something? Well, they look for eyewitnesses, don't they? Nowadays, they want dash cams and CCTV and all that kind of thing, and maybe WhatsApp messages nowadays as well. But really, it's eyewitnesses, people that were there, that saw it, that can testify to what truly happened. And that is John. John watched these things occur. So we know that it is a trustworthy source of information. The second little side note is that John just obeys straight away. It says that at the end of 27. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. One example of how to react when God calls us to do something. Of course, we do not get the same call directly like Jesus gave to John. But God calls us in other ways to do other things for him. And we should obey like John obeyed. But you know, it's more than that. Jesus is telling John to take his place as son to Mary. To care for her. And you know, similarly, I can't say that, similarly, Jesus is taking John's place on the cross. Now, it wasn't that John deserved a crucifixion. It wasn't that John was a, a murderer, a robber, things like this. But John, like all of us, had done wrong. And he had to face God's wrath for sin. Now, why? Well, you know, why? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, but, but why is that the case? Well, Peter, very helpfully this morning, talked us through that, that that relationship is broken. God, the creator God, made everything perfect, and yet sin came in and broke that relationship between God and man. Sin causes a separation from us and God that needs fixed. And Jesus is the plan of salvation. And we need to be made right. Why do we need to be made right? Well, to spend eternity in heaven. We don't know much about heaven. The Bible doesn't say an awful lot about heaven. But essentially heaven is eternity with God. And God cannot have us there if we are not made right. If we are not perfect as we should be. And we're not, are we? You know, if we had a plaque with our name on it, and we had our accusations underneath, don't think any one of them would be particularly terrible, so to speak, as society might say. But you know what? I would not like my sins to be written on a plaque for all to see. We have all done wrong. We all have sin. But Jesus, he had done no wrong. That was only possible because he was God. But he takes that place for everyone else. So that we may be made righteous, just means to be made right, looked on as innocent by God because of the work of the cross. If you're not a believer in Jesus today, you've not trusted him with your future. If you've not repented for all the wrong things that you've done, and we know that we have, then I implore you to address that this morning, this very day. It is the most important thing. And that takes us to our final thing we see about Jesus, the Redeemer, in 28 to 30. So up to verse 27, we've had the first three hours on the cross, okay? And then between 27 and 28, which John doesn't talk about, but you can read it in the other Gospels, we have the three hours of darkness. Now we know from those other accounts of Jesus' life that Christ at this point suffers. He is forsaken by the Father. And he takes that just punishment that we deserve because of our rebellion and our sinful ways. So Jesus has borne this. And then in verse 28, 
and it says later, showing a period of time has, has, has passed, knowing that everything had now been finished. You might say, well, how did Jesus know everything was finished? Well, one, he has taken that punishment in those three hours of darkness. The work has been done. But he also knows because he is God that his death is about to come. He is about to give up his life, as it says. His substitutionary death is imminent. He can only know that because he can willingly give it up. So Jesus, he says, I am thirsty. In other versions it says, I thirst. So he takes his drink from the soldiers. So as I said, the soldiers, they've been out, they've been out um, for about six hours at this point in the heat of the day in Jerusalem, a hot land. And this basically, this wine vinegar, this was just a drink that they would have to, to keep themselves going. It was their job to stay there. I presume being the Roman Empire, they were not allowed to go on, on breaks or anything like that. So this was just a drink that they used for thirst as they went through the day. It's worth noting that this was a different drink to what was offered to Jesus, the drink with gall, it's sometimes called, before the cross. That was a sedative, that was an ancient painkiller that was offered to the person to dull the pain, to dull the senses as they went to a crucifixion. But Jesus, he refused that because he had to be in his full mind to take the punishment of the cross. But this here, Jesus says, I thirst, and he takes this wine vinegar. And it is lifted to him on the stalk of a hyssop plant. So backtracking a wee bit, we know it's Friday. It's the day of the preparation of the Passover. So the Passover is on the Saturday, the Sabbath, the Jewish holy day. It was the week was building up to that. And the Jews, they would kill the Passover lamb and they would eat it and they would celebrate that on the Saturday. But being the Sabbath, the Jewish holy day, they had rules that they couldn't do things like that. Modern day equivalent, they couldn't turn the light bulb on, they couldn't switch on the oven. It all had to be done on the day of the preparation, on the Friday, the day before. And the Passover festival, it remembers when the Israelites were rescued from Egypt. You can read that in Exodus 12. The Israelites, God's people, they were in Egypt and they were saved out of Egypt And they were spared the plague of the death of the firstborn son. And they did that by killing a lamb and spreading its blood on the doorposts of their homes. When God saw that blood on the posts, then he passed over and death was avoided. That's what happened back in Exodus 12. So why am I telling you that? Well, In Exodus 12, verse 22, they instructed that they are to use the branches of the hyssop plant to spread the blood of the lamb. Jesus is the sacrificed lamb. Allowing punishment and death to be avoided, to be passed over through obedience to God and trust in him. Ian, last week, he took us through the brutality of the flogging. how it would just rip someone's back open. It was a horrible thing. And the people often died from that alone, never mind making it to the crucifixion. So blood was running down this cross that Jesus was on from his back. It was running down from his head in the crown of thorns, the beatings that he had had, the the nails through his hands and his feet. Jesus is the Redeemer. His blood was shed. He is paying the debt for others. The blood of the lamb pays the debt. Hebrews 9, it talks about um, the ancient um, blood sacrificed on, on, on many altars in Israel. And it talks about the Lord Jesus. And in verse 22, it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But Jesus' blood was shed because he is the lamb the sacrificial lamb that allows God to pass over in judgment and allows people to be saved. And after this, Jesus receives the drink and he says his famous last word, it is finished. The work was done. It was complete. The plan of salvation that was hatched before time has been carried out to the full. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Jesus gives up his spirit. He gives up his life in a way that we can never do, knowing that his work was done. Jesus' suffering on the cross can give us freedom if we trust in him and if we seek forgiveness for our wrong. The fulfillment of prophecy that we've seen here, it shows that Jesus wasn't just another person dying. It wasn't just another person killed by the Romans, but that he was God himself in human form. And you know, as Christians, if we're sitting here today and you believe all this and that is brilliant, then we want to emulate the Lord Jesus bearing in mind that we will never match up to how he is. But we want to finish God's plan for our lives. God has a plan for each and every one of us. And we are to live that out and seek to end our lives well. Paul, in one of his, his letters in 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8, which is potentially some of his last words that he spoke or certainly wrote down anyway, he says this, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let's run the the race well and finish strongly. Remembering that our home is actually in heaven. And that we are just foreigners in this world. And that we have a better place to go to. Let me just pray as we finish. God and Father, I just thank you for your word. Thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. That that plan was hatched before time even began. Before the creation of this world. That the Lord Jesus would do the will of the Father And go down and be that lamb who was sacrificed. We thank you for the truth that we've seen in this passage this morning. And we pray that these things will continue in our minds and in our hearts this week as we think towards Easter. And we thank you so much for the glorious news of the resurrection. (coughs) That the Lord Jesus rose again and that he is the right hand of the Father on high, and that we worship a God who is not dead, but is alive. Amen. Amen. Just hand back to Fiona, and we're going to sing Jesus Paid It All. And you know the hymns this morning? They've just been so great in putting our minds in the right place for what we've been looking at. And this one here, Jesus, he's paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Yeah, let's stay seated, I think, for this one, just to sort of reflect on what we've heard, and then we could stand to sing the final song, Worthy is the Lamb. But we'll stay seated for this one. <laughs> Oh, Lord, 
So let's just close with these words from Romans chapter 5. They just say this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so this is the news of the gospel. Why don't we take a seat? That's the end of our service. And let me just thank you for coming. And what a powerful passage that we've thought about today. And so let me just encourage us not to rush off. Um, Do hang around. We'd love to get to know you, particularly if you're new here. Uh, But it would be great just to do business with God today. If you've come this morning, you don't know this Jesus as your saviour, we would love it if we could introduce you to him today. So that's the end of our service. Let me just tell you about a few things that are coming up this week. Uh, We have our evening service at 6.30. It's in the upstairs hall, the last installment in that series in Zephaniah. John will be there. Please do come along to that. We're going to have a QA and a as part of that that evening. We've got Five Beside Football on Tuesday, 8 o'clock at Pepper Mill, which are the, the uni pitches. That's open for open to absolutely anybody. So if you think that you want to play, uh, then please speak to Aaron, put your hand up, Aaron, and uh, we'll, we'll fix you out with that. We'd love to, to get you involved there. Growth groups are on this week. Your leader will be in touch just to tell you about when and where uh, yours is meeting and maybe how you can connect with the week of prayer. And lastly, just to say, please do grab the Easter flyers before you go today. Tell you about the things that are going on next weekend. Pete's already mentioned about the Easter Open Day. We've got our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock on Friday. That is just a really special time where we get together and think about the Lord's death on Good Friday. Please do come along to that with 7 o'clock. We've got our all-age Easter service here on Sunday at 11 o'clock as well, followed by Easter egg rolling. Am I right in thinking both of those services will be live streamed as well on YouTube? So if you can't make it out in person, you'll be able to watch online live. And then we're joining with churches all over the city for the Origin event, the Resurrection event on the Sunday evening, 7.30, Usher Hall. Always a highlight in the church calendar in the city Um, You have to go on the Origin Scotland website to get your tickets as well. But let me just thank you for coming. If you've got any questions about anything that's going on today, or if you'd like to pray about anything, then please grab someone you've seen up the front, or maybe somebody you've come with today. We'd love to be able just to do that together. But thank you so much for coming, and have a wonderful week. Two. Two.